Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. I wish I could be coming to you under better circumstances today, but there's no real positive way to spin what happened yesterday. The American space program took a significant hit on a couple of fronts, but the most significant hit, the most obvious and spectacular hit, came in the form of another failed Starship test. Now, I'm, before I go any further here, to save myself from grief and you guys as well, if you are a SpaceX fanboy who feels that they can do no wrong, that they're above criticism, and really nobody should ever be saying anything negative about them, I'd recommend that you just go ahead and click off of this thing right now, because I'm going to be going on a bit of a rant this time, and I'm not wearing this SLS shirt um, by accident. I think that yesterday demonstrated quite clearly that SLS cannot be abandoned yet. We are in no way ready to transition over to Starship, even though, I'm going to be clear, it is a much better concept. It is a much more advanced and innovative concept. It is a concept that will ultimately take human beings across the solar system. It, it has the capability to do that. I'm no longer 100% sure, though. I'm about 99% sure, because I think that once Trump leaves office, if these problems haven't been completely ironed out, I would say a new administration might very well shut this thing down, because this rocket in its current state is a menace, and there is no way that the FAA should have allowed it to fly yesterday, given how similar its failure was to what happened in January. Really, even though some efforts were made to try to correct the problems that cropped up here, it is clear that whatever happened on the January flight happened again in March. There's really no difference. As a matter of fact, the failure happened almost at precisely the same time in the flight. I'm going to go ahead and review all of this with you. We're going to go ahead and just do a reaction video to the flight. I'm going to show you all the details, everything that we know right now. And where do we go from here? So let's have a look at just how similar these flights actually were. At least at the beginning, we are seeing what is essentially the same flight, all engines nominal on both rockets. You may, however, notice that the clock is a little bit ahead on flight seven at the top right-hand side of your screen. That really couldn't be helped because we started out with the same timing and then flight seven got a little bit ahead. I think we had a lag on flight eight on X not much of a lag, but it makes it impossible to really do everything side by side precisely with the same count being on the clock. But as you can see, all of this was very similar indeed. There were some observers who said that the rocket cleared the pad quicker on flight eight. I don't think so. Now that we look at this all side by side, I really think that it was pretty much identical in terms of when the rocket was released, when it took off from the pad, etc. So at this stage, everything looks nominal, really, with both flights, even though we know that with Flight 7, the vibrations being created by the 33 engines on the booster may have caused damage to the flight hardware and some propellant leaks, although we're not sure if the vibrations happened post-separation or pre-separation? Was it the boost that caused the vibrations and the damage, or was it the ignition of the engines on the second stage, or perhaps even the hot stage separation? SpaceX hasn't been entirely forthcoming on all of the details with that, and honestly, I'm not sure if they are fully aware of everything that happened on Flight 7 anyway, given how unsuccessful Flight 8 was. So here's what the FAA has announced, by the way, quote, the FAA is requiring SpaceX to perform a mishap investigation into the loss of the Starship vehicle.
vehicle during launch operations on March 6th. During the event, the FAA activated a debris response area and briefly slowed aircraft outside the area where space vehicle debris was falling or stopped aircraft at their departure location. Normal operations have resumed. So a mishap investigation is designed to enhance public safety, determine the root cause of the event, and identify corrective actions to avoid it from happening again. So here you go. You have two Raptor failures with Flight 8, one Raptor failure with Flight 7, although not permanent failures in either case. And also you may have noticed that an RCS thruster fired on both vehicles in both flights to stabilize starship after the hot stage separation so again no differences really whatsoever between the flights except for the number of engines failing and which engines that sort of thing so again the Raptor not performing perfectly either but certainly well enough to get the job done with the booster but nevertheless you can't just ignore this these engines did not relight when they were supposed to Again, indicating that we have some work to do with these engines as well as other things on Starship, but no sign of any trouble at this stage with the Starship Orbiter, at least nothing visually. Everything went just as well with the booster on both flights. Really, when it comes down to it, SpaceX has mastered the process of capturing the booster. Now, reusing the booster, that is an entirely different story. SpaceX hasn't even attempted to do anything like that yet. They've reused one or two engines here or there, and that's pretty much it. So we have the booster in free fall at this stage. Once again, picking up a lot of heat here as well. That's something that's a little different than Falcon 9 when the booster on that rocket comes back simply because it's a smaller surface area being exposed to the air as it is plunging through the atmosphere at high hypersonic velocity it definitely seems to be heating up the engines and just that whole bottom section of the booster during that process we're going to be seeing that here shortly but once again nothing seemingly going wrong whatsoever with the orbiter but Obviously, problems were already transpiring with the orbiter here, and you're going to see why. The very same things that created the problem with Flight 7 have to have caused the problems with Flight 8, given where everything goes wrong with both flights. Again, that hasn't come up yet but it will, unfortunately. So again, the booster looking beautiful with its re-entry trajectory. The hot staging ring falling away. Again, no real problems there either. As I say, the booster, that is the big positive takeaway from this flight and from the Starship program in general. But again, that doesn't matter as much as what happens to the orbiter. The orbiter is what deploys the payloads. The orbiter is what's going to the moon. The orbiter is what's going to Mars. The orbiter is what's going to be refueling these vehicles over and over again in low Earth orbit. And it's going to have to do all of these things in rapid succession. As spectacular as everything is with the booster, well, it just doesn't matter unless the orbiter problems get rectified completely. Again, we're starting to see the engine section of the booster glowing red hot as it passes through some pretty dense atmosphere at hypersonic velocities. I mean, that area is taking a substantial amount of punishment during this process, and no one outside of SpaceX really knows how much punishment the engine section is actually taking. Now, this is is interesting. It took a lot longer for the engines to fire on the booster on Flight 8 than it did on Flight 7. That is very interesting indeed. The results were essentially the same, but you have the booster on Flight 7 being nestled into the chopsticks already as the booster for Flight 8 is approaching the chopsticks. So all of that happened substantially earlier with Flight 7 than it did with Flight Flight 8. Once again, in my opinion, these are minor details and fairly unimportant when it comes right down to it. What happened to the orbiter is what's important here, but still, the result is the same. Super impressive when we're talking.
talking about what SpaceX has been able to accomplish with this booster and its potential reusability in the future. Although, again, to be clear, no booster has been reused yet, and as far as we know, there's no solid plans to reuse a booster anytime in the near future, perhaps with Flight 9 or 10, but again, with everything that's happened, all of this is still quite speculative. Now, as everyone was celebrating the catch of the booster, things were going very, very wrong on the orbiter. It is obvious, given the fact that we have a section of a vacuum raptor visibly glowing in Flight 8, well, we had a fire, obviously, going in the engine compartment already, almost certainly as a result of the same issues. And again, there goes the engines shutting down almost immediately, and the engines again shutting down almost immediately with Flight 6 seven as well as you can see we're down to two engines on flight seven and flight eight with both vehicles tumbling out of control unfortunately flight seven didn't show us the attitude of the vehicle and whether or not it was tumbling but we must assume that it probably was and also down to one engine very early it's possible actually that the vehicle's down to zero engines with communications having been lost at that point but here's an important difference we have two engines still burning on the orbiter in flight eight we're going to go ahead and switch completely over to flight eight now and have a look at just how bad this situation became two vacuum raptors still going they absolutely should have shut these engines down by this point but i'm pretty certain that spacex had no communication and no control whatsoever over the vehicle finally dropping down to one engine again perhaps there were no engines going at that point or perhaps there was still only one but we have one engine going in the flight seven footage just so you know even though you can't see it anymore it did have one engine still showing and then we're down to zero zero engines but here's what's important about all of this and why it really irritates the hell out of me once again there may have been nothing spacex could have done about this because they didn't have any effective control but these engines were still burning on this vehicle for one minute and 20 seconds during that time starship was traveling at about 20,000 kilometers per hour meaning that before SpaceX managed to shut these Raptors down. Starship traveled almost 450 kilometers completely out of control. For European viewers, that's greater than the distance from London to Carlisle. For viewers out in the western United States, that's quadruple the distance from Denver to Fort Collins. For those of you on the west coast of the United States, that's only 100 kilometers short of the distance from LA to San Francisco. It is a vast area of space that Starship managed to cover while being completely out of control and with engines still firing. Therefore, it is entirely possible that Starship went out of its re-entry corridor during re-entry. And the impact on commercial aviation was obvious, with flights being delayed or canceled as far away as Miami. So the question is, where do we go from here? It's obvious that whatever problems created the failure of Flight 7 were clearly duplicated with Flight 8. I don't think it's a coincidence that we had both rockets failing at precisely the same time, with engines shutting down at precisely the same time, and it was both both impractical and irresponsible for the FAA to allow SpaceX to proceed with another launch before the investigation of Flight 7 was complete. And the FAA absolutely needs to wait until the investigations are complete with both Flight 8 and Flight 7 before greenlighting another flight. Honestly, I don't know if it's going to go that way given the disproportionate and frankly ridiculous amount of authority that Elon Musk currently wields in the government, but that is the way it absolutely needs to go. And if you disagree with me, ask yourself this question and be honest. If this happened with Vulcan Centaur or if this had happened with a Jeff Bezos flight with Blue Origin, would you feel the same way? 
Would you think that it would be responsible for the FAA to greenlight another flight before an investigation was completed after two consecutive disruptions of commercial air traffic, after two failed flights with debris falling well outside of the re-entry corridor, potentially putting civilian lives at risk? It isn't responsible when China allows rocket boosters to fall uncontrolled into the atmosphere, disrupting commercial air traffic, and it isn't responsible when SpaceX does it either. And the only way to minimize the chances of this ever occurring again is to complete an in-depth investigation of what actually caused both of these failures and to implement some very thorough corrective actions to make sure that this doesn't reoccur. Honestly, as I said before, I'm not sure if that's actually going to happen. But when it comes right down to it, I've got one more recommendation to make. Elon Musk needs to get his ass out of Washington and get back to Boca Chica and fix this problem with his rockets. Even though he's not the engineer building them, he provides the kind of guidance and the kind of leadership that allowed SpaceX to succeed as well as it did in the past. And if he feels that his responsibilities in the government are more important, well, maybe he needs to put Starship development on hold until the government no longer needs it. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal. Or also, there's a lot of new merch available. All the details in the description. And this is what allows me to travel and bring you a lot of unique content, including the upcoming Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, the biggest space conference in the United States coming up next month. That's something you'd like to support. Support. Once again, all the details in the description. Thanks again, and until next time, stay angry about space.